Hey, Bob Nation, voice of the Buffs, Mark Johnson, coming up this week on the Bubbly Stampede, a split for the CU men's basketball team up in Oregon. We're going to break it down with my broadcast partner, Scott Wilkie. How about the CU women's basketball team sweeping a road trip up and against the Washington schools? We're also going to talk some volleyball, soccer, and much more, plus staff changes for the football team. We're going to meet new defensive coordinator Chris Wilson. That's all coming up on the Bubbly Stampede. Touchdown! Touchdown, Colorado! And the Buffaloes find the end zone! How about that? Beautiful shot for the Colorado can celebrate. Here comes Ralphie and your Colorado Buffaloes. I should take it. Maya's good from out top. Let me hear you, Buff fans! She's gonna fire the shot. Goal, Buffaloes. Oh! Holy cow! What a play by Colorado! For three, they made a pay! The ball fake, shot clock at four, fires a three, misses that one, offensive rebound, inside, Schwartz powers it up with the left hand for the left side, off the glass, hits up and good, counted whistle, and a foul against the Oregon Ducks, that's two rebounds. There's some highlights from the Buffaloes opening up that two-game road swing through Oregon as they take on the Oregon Ducks. Ends up in a four-point loss. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Buffalo Stampede. Voice of the Buffs, Mark Johnson. Buffs great. My broadcast partner, Scott Wilkie, joining us here for a couple of minutes. We're going to get to the OSU game in just a moment, but we'll start off with the Oregon game. Should we only talk about the first half of the Oregon game? Because that was pretty good after halftime. I'm not sure we want to discuss that too much. We had the lead. We were playing pretty <laughs> well. Um, but, you know, it's always tough to win in Eugene, but that was one game where we had a pretty good chance to get, to get them up there. Buffalo's came out. They were shooting the ball well. They were rebounding exceptionally well as it turned out in the ball game. Scott, you got to wonder what happens with a team like Colorado. They come into this weekend as one of the top turnover teams in the, in the Pac-12 conference. What I mean by that, fewest turnovers, only averaging just over 10 per ball game. And I don't know what happened. They opened that second half. They were averaging a turnover a minute. They had 11 turnovers in the first 11 minutes of that second half. It was just uncanny. Yeah, and Oregon does press and, you know, they can get you sped up. But I don't think it was so much about what was Oregon was doing. It was really more about Colorado. In that first 10 minutes, Colorado wasn't catching the ball cleanly. They weren't taking care of it. And uh, they, they let the game kind of get out, get crazy. What was really kind of damaging about that is the Buffaloes went minus nine in the second half points off turnovers. And when you're playing a team as good as Oregon is, they, they're a top 25 caliber team. You, you can't do that and overcome those kind of things, especially on the road. What Oregon's really good at is conversion. When they get the ball on a turnover, they have a lot of speed, a lot of athleticism, and they'll score in three or four seconds. And they took advantage of those turnovers Colorado created. What was interesting about that ball game is how well Colorado did rebound that ball game. They ended up plus what was it 12 or 13 in the ball game and still weren't able to come overcome all those turnovers. Yeah, and the three-point shooting didn't help things either. Right. So the turnovers and the three-point shooting, those two things combined against a solid team. It was a it was a low-scoring game, wasn't a clean game, but Oregon is a very good team. Buffaloes had an opportunity. That's been a very home-heavy schedule. I think it's 13 straight now. The home team has won after the ball game. We heard from head coach Tad Boyle. Yeah, there was there's Two things in this game. I mean, this is not a real difficult one to dissect as a coach um, from, 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 from my perspective. And, and one is turnover, 17 of them, which we know, we knew going in, we, had, we wanted to keep it to 11 or less, which is our goal. And that's hard to do sometimes against Oregon. Um, but yeah, we, our inability to pass and catch and come eat passes was, was, uh, was pathetic, you know, by, by some veteran players. It's not like we had a bunch of freshmen out there. but. Our inability to take care of the ball, uh, and then our inability to guard the ball in the second half. You know, Duarte and Will Richards, they were just going ISO driving. And, uh, you know, we've got to be able to have the gumption to step up and get a stop. And, and uh, you know, you, you work on those things in practice, and you talk about them in scatter reports, but unless you go out and execute. And, and, and you know what, with all that being said, we still had a chance. We had a great look, um, you know, down two, great look from three, and then they come down and we, we can't stop them, and, and Will Richardson takes the lane and spins and scores on us. And, you know, sometimes it's uh, their players down the stretch made plays. Our players down the stretch didn't make plays. Head coach Tad Boyle after the Buffaloes dropped a four-point ball game in Eugene, Oregon to the Oregon Ducks, a very winnable contest. You know, one of the guys we talk about all the time on the radio broadcast at Colorado Basketball Network is Deshaun Schwartz kind of being an indicator 
I always say, boy, if he gets double digits, you feel good about it. He had a huge game, in fact, against the Ducks, and it still didn't turn out the way we thought it would. Yeah, the Buffs didn't take advantage of one of his better games of the year, a double-double, uh, rebounded very well. Um, and Colorado, usually when he gets double figures, win most of those ball games. Yeah. It didn't happen on Thursday. 16 points, 11 rebounds for the senior out of Colorado Springs. One of the other issues for Colorado was the bigs inside. Dallas Walton, Evan Batty ended up going one for 10 combined. Scott, they missed, what, eight or nine bunnies, I think, out of those 10. Yeah, they didn't finish well around the rim, and uh, Evan also had four turnovers. Probably one of the worst games for him as a Colorado buff, um, but you don't see that happen very often. So. You know, you give him a break on that one game. You know, the, the, you played inside, though. And you know when you're a big body like that in the paint, you got to be strong around the rim. And, and use the backboard when you're in there. Yeah, what you're taught as a big man from when you're little is go through contact. You know, you're going to hit contact. you got to push through it and score anyway. They didn't do that on Thursday night. Yeah. Well, I mean, remember, as you just said, you learn as a big man when you're little. <laughs> Bigs actually were little at, at one point in time. The defensive effort against Oregon, though, was good enough to win – but I think with the safe, safe for maybe the last, what, four or five minutes of that game. Yeah, and then the Oregon went to kind of an isolation game. Uh, Richardson uh, went isolation in uh, Duarte. Yep. And we weren't able to get enough stops late in that game. Yeah, Buffaloes did a pretty good job in the perimeter defense, but had some breakdowns late. So they dropped the opener of the two-game swing through Oregon. And then they bounced back coming up on Saturday at Oregon State. We'll tell you about that coming up next here at the Buffalo Stampede. Works it off the left side. Out of the baseline. Spins his way into the paint. Hooks shot with the right hand. Is up and good. Oh, that was a nifty shot by McKinley Wright. And that right there puts him over 1,700 in his career. The ninth Buffalo all time to do that. Nearly every single ball game, McKinley Wright is one of the great buffs of all time. He's going to hit some milestone, 1,700 points. The ninth Colorado Buffalo later on in the contest, by the way, moved into number eight all time in scoring, surpassing the great Josh Scott, but 1,700 points now for 600 rebounds, 600 assists. As the Buffaloes pick up a road victory in Corvallis and win it by four over OSU. Scott Wilkie, voice of the Buffs, uh, Mark Johnson. That was really kind of a gut check kind of win for Colorado. Yeah, and, you know, like we've seen a lot of times, second half, McKinley kind of took over the game. Yeah. He became very aggressive and was very confident in his game tonight. You know, the turnovers, though, became an issue once again. Well, they have uh, 16 in this ball game. That's 33 turnovers in the last, ball, last couple ball games, if I'm doing the math correctly, and, and really hurt Colorado in the second half. Yeah, and it wasn't the Oregon State was creating those turnovers necessarily. It was Colorado um, not making smart plays, you know, bad passes. Unforced turnovers. What do you say about McKinley Wright by this point in time? I mean, he goes down as one of the greats of all time. The numbers he's put up, the way he's done it at his size. You said during the radio broadcast at one point as well, the numbers are, are impressive. Maybe it's the intangibles that are more valuable to this team. Yeah, uh, when you're around the team like we have been the last four years, you know how the team respects him, the coaching staff, other teams respect him. And so that leadership probably is even more important than all these numbers we keep talking about. You know, the shooting was not great in this ball game again. That's three games in a row. The Buffs are shooting 20% from downtown, 12 of 60 in the last three games. The good news is they get to come home here, and you hope that gets fixed. But this has been a team that consistently has been one of the top two or three three-point shooting teams all season long. It's kind of abandoned them here in the last three. Yeah, shooting is a confidence thing, and right now the confidence is low on some of our shooters, and you hope they get it back quick because we're nearing the end of the season. They, they need to feel feel good about their shooting. You know, another guy that was impressive uh, was Dry Horn. He ends with 10 points and five rebounds. It just it seems to be just consistent. Write it down pretty much every game for Dry Horn. He was pretty good for the Buffaloes as they get the victory on the road against Oregon State. And after the ball game, we heard from head coach Tad Boyle again. Well, it was a hard-fought win. We, we certainly don't make it easy on ourselves, you know, in the second half. Boy, our, our, our offense in the second half, last few games, has kind of gone a little stagnant and dry. You know, but shoot first half, 52%, pretty darn efficient, shot the ball pretty well. And then, you know, but our turnovers, Mark, are becoming an issue, and, and that's where we make it hard on ourselves. We had, you know, we had nine of them at halftime, and we had, we had you know, finished the game with 16. That's, that's, that's too many. You know, we want to keep that thing under 11. And, uh, you know, McKinley Wright was, was great down the stretch. We, we made free throws when we had to. And I thought our perimeter defense, Eli Parquet did a great job on Jared Lucas. I thought uh, McKinley on Reichel most of the night. And then we switched him over to uh, Ethan Thompson, who's a heck of a player. Uh, great defensive effort. You know, and that's, that's, what, that's what won us the game tonight. 
There's head coach Tad Boyle after the Buffalo's four-point victory on the road against Oregon State. Scott, that's the 11th conference win for Colorado and the fifth road victory for the Buffaloes. That's two numbers they have never reached in Pac-12 conference play since joining this league a decade ago. It's really tough, Mark, to be 500 on the road in a conference play. That's an impressive thing. And 11 wins, another record for CU, and chance they beat that here on the weekend. So. Uh, you can say it's one of the best seasons Colorado's had. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, there's been talk about it. It is an expanded 20-game schedule now. But keep in mind, they've only played 17 games. So they've done this within the confines of, uh, you know, the 18-game schedule they traditionally would have had. Let's talk a little bit about Tristan De Silva. He had a couple of big plays down the stretch, in fact. Had a three-point play. That young man now playing more minutes with Jabari Walker out. By the way, they expect to have Jabari back. Potentially, is the L.A. schools this weekend. But he continues just to evolve and grow as a player, doesn't he? Yeah, I really like his defense. You know, he had five points, four rebounds or whatever tonight. But he can defend little guys. He can defend big guys. He stays in front of his guy. He just plays fundamental defense, just like he does on the offensive end. Rarely makes a mental mistake, which means he's in the right position almost all the time. You get the impression he had really good coaching when he was a young player. Yeah over in Germany. You, you can kind of tell. His older brother Stanford's pretty good as well, and he's a very similar kind of player uh, to him as the Buffaloes get this road victory. Scott, now they got a chance, so coming home with the L.A. schools coming to town. USC just lost. UCLA, they're the top two teams in the league. Big opportunity for Colorado coming up this weekend. It would be really fun if this place was filled up on <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Saturday. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's a great chance for Colorado. USC is a really good team who's gotten a lot better. UCLA on Saturday. I'm really looking forward to those games. It's always fun to play the best teams. When we're done here, we're going to go over and talk to all the fan cutouts and see if we can get them some energy coming up on Thursday night as they've got USC coming to town. And then the final regular season game will be UCLA next weekend here at the Event Center. Coming up next in the Buffalo Stampede, we're talking a lot of sports. There's a lot going on now with the delay and the start to many seasons, and it was a busy weekend for Colorado. I think we're good to go. Welcome to our first Chalk Talk. Happy to have the opportunity to, to speak with all of you guys. Yeah, we started doing Chalk Talks uh, when our staff came to Colorado in 2015. You know, we felt like it was an opportunity to get to know some of the fans, help some of our fans understand the, the sport a little bit better and give them an opportunity to ask questions. And uh, it's been a really good experience so far. So that's kind of why most teams actually put the ball kind of short on top of the setter. These are all good questions. Yeah, it was the first one in a while, obviously, and uh, unfortunately had to be over Zoom. But uh, it, it was really good. We had a, a large following. We had a lot of really good questions. Um, you know, usually I have a, a topic to cover, but since we hadn't uh, been together in so long, I wanted to kind of keep it open for, for questions. And, um, you know, like I said, we have, we have fans that are really engaged and, and ask a lot of questions and really uh, follow our team uh, really well. That's head coach Jesse Mahoney, the volleyball team, with his chalk talk ahead of the Buffaloes. A couple of matches with the Washington Huskies in Boulder over the weekend. I'm voice of the Buffs, Mark Johnson. Welcome back to the Buffalo Stampede. On Friday, the Buffs lost a close one to Washington, despite the fact that in her Colorado debut, Leah Clayton had 29 kills. So after a close loss on Friday, the Buffaloes couldn't overcome on Sunday a slow start against number 10 ranked Washington, losing in three sets, 25-22, 25-22, and 26-24. Colorado made some strong defensive adjustments from Friday, holding the Huskies to a 208 hitting percentage, but close set plays and late starts were too difficult to overcome for CU. In the eight sets played this weekend, only one was decided by more than three points. Defensively, Colorado did all it could to slow down Washington. Sterling Parker led the team with three blocks, while Brenda Deluzio put up 14 digs. Jill Schneggenberger added 10 digs of her own, but it was not enough to hold back Claire Hoffman and Sam Dreschel, who had 14 and 12 kills respectively. So a couple of close losses in volleyball to Washington. That was not the case for the CU women's basketball team. How about the way the Buffs are playing? J.R. Payne and company were into the great Northwest to take on Washington and Wazoo. They come up with a big sweep over the weekend and had a little celebratory snowball fight after one of those victories. So the sweep over the weekend puts the Buffaloes over the 500 mark for the first time this season since they were 2-1. They're now 10-9 overall. And how about this? 500 in Pac-12 conference play at 8-8. Eight eight. After the victory over the Cougars, we heard from head coach J.R. Payne. I am, I am, wow, I am just really proud of our ball club. Um, 
There were a lot of things we didn't do well, um, yeah. giving up 18-0 boards. I think we gave up five on one possession alone, you know, and fouled a couple three-point shooters and things like that. But there were so many positives, you know, as far as taking care of the basketball, finding different ways, you know, to get Maya the basketball, um, you know, a lot of just different things we had to do. We switched up our defense late and um, there was a lot of good things. Super, super proud of our team for getting this victory, which as we all know, has, is uh, difficult to get in the Palouse. We were trying to find a balance of um, when we got a defensive rebound, like, okay, everybody settle down, settle. Let's run a good possession. Let's get a good look. Sometimes if we do that too much, it does make us hesitant. Um, and when they re we're really kind of picking up the pressure and, um, you know, things like that, it put us in a little bit of a discombobulated feel at times offensively, getting from the backcourt to the front court. Um, but I thought we actually got better as we went along against it. So congratulations to the CU women's basketball team. After the sweep over the weekend, they've got one regular season game left this weekend. They'll be in Salt Lake City to take on Utah. Now on to women's lacrosse here at the University of Colorado. The women are 0-2 on the season, dropping two matches to SEC schools, including an overtime loss in Nashville against Vanderbilt this weekend. Uh, against the Commodores, the Buffaloes were up early, but were unable to hang on to the lead late in the second half and fell in overtime 11-10 to, to Vanderbilt. Junior Charlie Rudy and senior Zoe Lawless each had a hat trick in the contest, and four of the Buffaloes contributed one goal apiece. Despite CU's offensive output, the Buffs were unable to keep the Commodores off the board, and every time CU started to pull away, the Commodores came right back. Once again, the Buffaloes were not able to convert on their free position opportunities, going one for four in the game. They were 0 of three in the first half, but were one of one in the second half. So now women's lacrosse comes home. They've got their home opener at Prentiff Field on Sunday at 1 o'clock as they'll take on rival DU. Now let's talk soccer. Danny Sanchez and the women's soccer team here at the University of Colorado remain unblemished. They're 3-0 in the season after shutting out Weber State this past weekend. The Buffaloes got a lone goal from Hannah Schartz, and we heard from her after the match. Yeah, um, I just knew I was being marked tightly, so I had to create my own separation, and I just created that space with the back post, and... Um, frame the goal and luckily Ali got like the perfect touch on it and it just bounced right to me and my job was easy just to finish it. <laughs> Everyone else did all the hard work. Yeah, um, I think they were definitely, it was a grinding game. Um, not easy, they go in really hard and we had to be a lot quicker than I think we anticipated at first so we kind of started slow but um, overall I, even though it wasn't our prettiest game we got the job done when it mattered and now it's just focusing on to conference play. Uh, it's just surreal. It feels like it's been so long since we've had a Pac-12 game, and it really has been. I think definitely over 450 days. I don't know the exact day, but um, we just feel so fortunate to get back at it, and I think we're more excited than ever, and traveling with the team is always fun, and that'll be like our first get-together with the new players and travel experience with them. So everyone's just really excited, and we're grateful to be playing and look forward to it. So soccer remains unblemished on the season. They're going to open up Pac-12 conference play now this weekend. Danny Sanchez and company will take to the road. They'll be in Seattle to take on the Washington Huskies. Coming up next here in the Stampede, there have been some staff changes, including some new hires for head football coach Carl Durrell and the football team. We're going to sit down with defensive coordinator Chris Wilson when we come back. It is deflected and picked off at the 10 yard line. The linebacker coming up for Colorado was Carson Wells. They tried to flip it up over the top, and Carson just tipped it in the air and came up with the interception. And they returned it all the way down inside the two yard line. Turnover number two. Hey, Buff Nation, voice of the bus, Mark Johnson here, introducing you to the new staff members on Carl Durrell's staff here at the University of Colorado. Well, he's not a new guy, and he's been here before coming the second time, so we all know who Chris Wilson is. He just got a big fancy office and a big fancy title and a defensive coordinator. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Still a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt about it. And you've got history. Let's go back and kind of talk uh, so fans can understand your history. You've been in this position before previously in your career. Absolutely. So you know what the expectations are with a job like this. Absolutely. The, the standard is obviously, number one, is to coach your guys. Yeah. But two is really about the organization and the leadership of the group. And so I, when, I, when you take a role as a coordinator, it's really le leading men. Yeah. and having great organization and being a great teacher. So that, that's really the, the biggest caveat part to this deal. When Carl was looking for a new D.C., tell me a little bit about the conversations. Was that something where you go to him and say, I'm interested, or he says, Chris, would you be interested? How do those things work out? Well, I, I think it was just a thing that you interview all year long. Hmm. 
and obviously I had it in my background. I had been a coordinator. So I think the biggest thing that, that, that Coach Darrell does well, he really puts guys in position to grow. Mm-hmm. And he wants to do it with it in-house if he has the, if he has the right people. And so uh, I think through the process of being here a year, got a chance to work with each other and the development of our guys, it, it made the transition. I was going to say, that, that's that got to be a little bit of an advantage. If you come in cold from the outside, you walk in, you don't know what you have. That's right. You've had a chance to get your hands on these guys for a full season and get to know who they are, so now you can kind of hit the ground running, can't you? Yeah, well, it definitely helps yeah. because now you have a gauge of kind of where guys are at, and uh, you've seen them under pressure. You've seen them uh, in their comfort zone, and so now it's about how do we improve? the developmental piece. So now, how can we make this as player-friendly as we possibly can? You know, I've talked many times with your friend and my friend, Gary Barnett, my broadcast partner, about the offensive responsibilities when you're a play caller and how you're, it's a chess match and you're thinking three steps ahead. Is it a similar philosophy on the defensive side? You're you're trying to think three, four, five steps ahead in terms of what's going to happen in this game? Absolutely. You know, it's a process of, 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 of actually knowing who they are um, what their issues are schematically as well yeah. as personnel wise and then being able to take off tape our issues schematically as well as personnel okay. so it's definitely a chess match all right well what I know this is a question that every one of the fans out there always wonders about a coach and a coordinator what's your vision for the defense <laughs> that we're physical okay the most physical defense in the Pac-12 uh, two is that we're very very intelligent we understand conceptually what should occur every snap and if we can do that it allows us to play really fast and uh, makes a really aggressive team and when you have that availability turnovers start happening you and now positive things occur for you. Is it a true statement that uh, defensive side of the football is an emotional side of the football? Uh, I wouldn't say that. No? I, I, don't, I don't believe it's emotional. Okay. I, I really believe after the first few snaps being a former player, it goes down to the basics okay. and, and, the, and, and the focus on the details. I think too often that when you get emotional, you start majoring in the minors. Mm. So the key is to focus on the details at all times. What changes for you now? You're still going to have your, your position guys you can take care of and, and do that. And, and how do you kind of divide that attention, if you will, between, okay, I'm dealing with that defensive front, but i got to worry about the entire defense? Well, the, the primary thing is, is to take care of your position. And, 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 and that's no matter what, what role you're in. Anytime you're in a position, you, you can't let that area falter. Okay. And then number two, it's about knowing who your guys are. And that dictates scheme. And and then from that we'll tweak it week to week based off of the people we're going to play. Yeah, are you the kind of coordinator you want all those defensive coaches? You want a lot of voices in that room. You want a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, input from those guys in terms of game plans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we got we got an experienced group of guys, guys with a ton of background, not only in the NFL but actually in college, exclusively the Pac-12. So why wouldn't I use that knowledge? Right. My dad always told me, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the wrong room. Well, I've never been in the wrong room that apparently. <laughs> Chris, congratulations. Thanks so much. All right. Well, you've known him for a long time. Now he's a defensive coordinator here at the University of Colorado. That'll put a wrap this week on the Buffalo Stampede. I'm voice of the bus, Mark Johnson. We'll talk to you next time.